Uh, just continue to talk amongst yourselves. Yeah. We'll be ready in like, you know, 50 yeah. more minutes. Uh, Mike's went away. Hang on a second. We, were, we came out here and there was a man furiously picking mics up. Uh, I don't know what's happening. All right. Everybody grab a sheet. Sorry. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, you can see it. Right. I'll, share, I'll share with Vic. Okay. 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 Right. Okay. 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 Just in case. Okay. Okay. Buddy, it's here with me. Oh, yeah. 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 Wait. So am I just going to hang it? Whatever you want to do. There's nobody next to me. <laughs> we got candy. Who wants candy? Do I get my own mic? Oh, you get your own mic. Oh. Two of your dreams came true. Everyone else, I'm sorry. I don't have strong arms. Should we look? Like you dream this buster. Is I just want you all to know that we have notepads, like we're going to take notes. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> if Tech could turn on the wired mic all the way to stage left. Uh, it's true, it's true, yes. <laughs> it essentially became a race, right? Uh, someone smells first. It's Jess. <laughs> just kidding, I love you. <laughs> I sense oh, yeah. fatigue in this room. So I don't know. Are you know tired? What... Have you done the, the weekend properly? <laughs> Are you tired? Are you a little tired? Are your voices a little a little uh, tired? And then you did it right. Yeah. Welcome to the last day of RTX 2017. How you doing? And if tech backstage could please turn on the other wired mic, we'd really <laughs> appreciate it. Anyway, yeah, welcome to the uh, voice acting for animation panel. <laughs> My name is Gray Haddock. I'm the head of Rooster Teeth Animation. Uh, I, I used to voice a guy named Roman Torchwick. I guess it's still kind of do on TV. And Locus and Doyle for RVB. And a whole bunch of stuff for a whole bunch of other companies, um, anime and movies and stuff like that. But let's just go down the row and introduce ourselves. Uh, hello, I am Lindsay Jones. Woo! I voice Vanessa Kimball in Red vs. Blue. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Space Kid in Camp Camp, and Ruby Rose in Ruby! Space Kid! Kid. <laughs> Me too. My name is Michael Jones. I play... Oh, hello. I play Max in Camp Camp, uh, Sun Wukong in Ruby, uh, and tiny little parts of background characters in real animes that uh, I'm not good enough to be the main character in. <laughs> Uh, hey, I'm Shannon McCormick. I'm the voice of Agent Washington. Uh, Professor Ozpin and Ruby, quartermaster, and other assorted quarter family members in <laughs> camp camp. Uh, and then a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of other things in other titles and properties. So thank you, guys. Hello. I'm Jessica. Um, I voice Cinderfall. Um, Boo! <laughs> um, I also I do the voice of. Who? Who? Who's talking tonight? <laughs> <laughs> I also do the voice of uh, Super Sonico for the English uh, anime and game dub, and I do some other things that I can't talk about yet. Woo! <laughs> Uh, hi, my name is Miles Luna. I voice uh, David in Camp Camp. Uh, I voice Jean Arc in Ruby, and I and I am Cronut and Felix in Red vs. Blue. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Vic Mignana. Uh, I am the old one here. I've I've. Uh, been doing this for a long time. I've, I've done over 300 different animated series, video games, Full Metal Alchemist, uh, Dragon Ball Z, Pokemon, Digimon, Naruto, Bleach, or on High School Host Club. Kiss, kiss, fall in love. And I love, I love all of you commoners. <laughs> uh, but no, I am and and uh, and and Crow in Ruby. 
And I just want to tell you guys how much I love being here. Um, I love this spirit. This is, I've heard so many great things about RTX for years. And I thought, damn it, I want to go. <laughs> but I wasn't a part of anything. And so I was so, so privileged to, uh, to get to be a part of Ruby and then to come here and meet these amazing people that do what they do out of passion and love, which is the only reason to do anything, I think. And uh, so, sorry, but I'm so happy to be here. So thanks for having me. I know, right? Thank you for being here. This is so cool to sit next to you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jen Brown. Oh, that's so nice. Uh, I'm Agent Carolina on Red vs. Blue. I am Pira and Lisa Lavender on Ruby. I am Arid on Camp Camp. Uh, uh, Harley Quinn for DC Universe Online. Um, I think it's the big question about, uh, oh, day five, but that's not voiceover. Uh, <laughs> uh, stuff. I do stuff. I do a lot of stuff. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sam Ireland. Hello. Um, um, I, I was CT on RVB, um, <laughs> and I play the Flower Scout on Camp Camp, all three. Mm -hmm. And I play Nora on Ruby. Yay! <laughs> Please say that again. Just say Nora. Nora! <laughs> That's totally gonna be my ringtone. I'm making that my ringtone. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm loving seeing everybody. This is fantastic. Like, uh, if you hadn't figured it out, we actually hardly ever cross each other's paths. Everybody gets recorded one by one uh, at the booth, or like in Vic's case, f from California. But, um, but anyways, yeah, it's fantastic for seeing everybody. Thanks for coming out today. Yeah, I thought that we would um, just talk for a bit about uh, what it's like uh, to voice act. How do you get into your characters? How do you get into different characters? And, and how did you guys get started? You know, where, um, you know, some folks you've been doing it as a full career. Some folks kind of stumbled into it. So um, let's just talk about uh, how you guys got into the biz. Want to go first? Uh, Monty Elm was like, yo, you want to be in my show? <laughs> <laughs> Same. Uh, in, in all honesty, for a lot of people in, within Ruby, um, and that's kind of the beauty of it, is we started because we were connected to Rooster Teeth, and Monty had this vision, this idea of what he wanted the show to be. And he wanted that to include his friends and coworkers. So for us, we were privileged enough to have him come to us and say, hey, I would like you to audition for the part. And uh, he approached me and said, I think you would be good for Blake or Ruby. I'm not sure which. And then we auditioned. And he said, OK, Ruby would work. And here we are. Um, for me, I kind of had a, a similar thing where, I mean, I watched um, anime and played video games ever since I was a kid, and it was always something I really uh, was interested in and wanted to do, but never really pursued beyond uh, making fun of a lot of people on Halo 2. I feel like that's where a lot of my voice acting uh, first started. Um, thank you. And, uh, you know, Starting at Rooster Teeth, uh, I had the opportunity to have a couple of small lines in Red vs. Blue, and uh, like Lindsay said, you know, when Monty was uh, creating Ruby, he had a, a small part that he was he wanted you know me to try out for, and it really started from there, and I and I really enjoyed doing it, and I I tried to pursue it a little more, and I was fortunate enough working at Rooster Teeth and to able to get a an audition at Funimation, and I ended up getting uh, the part of Sting Euclid in Fairy Tale. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> I've been doing that for about two years now, so I'm, I kind of grew from there, you know, meeting other directors and just doing little parts here and there and background characters and stuff, and you just, I'm just trying to learn as much as possible every time I, you know, meet a new person or have a new role or something like that, so I still have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, so I, uh, my first professional uh, voice acting gig was, uh, I did a bunch of dubs for the um, uh, clo now closed, lamentedly, uh, ADV studios that were here in Austin. They did anime dubbing back in the late 90s, early aughts. Um, 
I did uh, Akabane in Get Backers, was like the first big, big role that I had. I had some smaller roles before that. And the really cool thing was, I'm a theater actor and an uh, improv, uh, improv artist, and uh, the, the people who ran that studio were all Austin theater people, so they just hired all their actor friends to come, uh, to come do uh, dubs for them. Um, and then that led to, uh, that led to getting an audition with uh, Red vs. Blue, and I thought it was just a, a one-day gig. And here I am, ten years later, I'm still doing. You're many. trapped. I'm trapped. I'm really. I'm so over it. Um, <laughs> um, but but then the, but the other question is like, when did you start? And I always tell people like, I was doing dumb voices from before I can remember. There's like a family story of me running around the house when I was like two and a half, quoting lines from Friar Tuck in the old uh, Disney uh, Robin Hood movie, screaming, "Get out of my church!" And then my. <laughs> My kindergarten teacher um, had to tell me to stop breathing like Darth Vader, um, <laughs> which I did all day long. <laughs> She's like, you gotta stop doing that. Um, so I was like always just doing goofy voices and then I've been able to get paid uh, peanuts for that. So uh, yeah, so that, that's me. I'm like fangirling so hard up here right now. I don't know if you guys can tell, but um, how I got started was how everything kind of started with voice acting was all because of Monty. I remember Monty found me at New York Comic Con and he was kind of like, you want to be a bad guy? And I was like, sure, yeah. And he had this vision of kind of making this character that, or like putting me in this character that was so opposite of my personality. And he's like, I really just want to surprise people with what you can do. And I, I honestly just, it's, it's life changing what he did. And I think he's just, Fantastic, and I think we should all round of applause for Monty, yeah. because... Yeah. I have too many feels. But yeah. And then I did Supersonico, woo! <laughs> uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, one day my friend Monty said, hey, I have an idea for this really nerdy character, and I think you'd be great for him. <laughs> Sweet. Um, and then I uh, uh, wrote a character for Red vs. Blue named Felix that was uh, uh, a horrible backstabbing son of a bitch. And Matt went, I think you should audition for him. And I went, sweet. <laughs> and since then, I've questioned who I am. <laughs> uh, and, then, uh, and then I wrote a really peppy, enthusiastic camp counselor. And Jordan said, I think you should audition for him. <laughs> and I said, sweet. Um, it's really just been, I mean, I've been doing theater uh, since I was in middle school, but before that I was in the Boy Scouts doing skits around a campfire and making goofy voices and, and parroting everything I heard from Monty Python's Argument Clinic and all sorts of stuff. And I would always impersonate my favorite South Park characters uh, in middle school. And I don't know, I like doing goofy voices, I guess, because I'm weird. Um, and that's, uh, that's how I got here. It's, pretty weird. <laughs> I know there is a God because I am here right now. <laughs> uh, you can't write this stuff. You know, um, a long time ago, in a galaxy, in a galaxy far, far off, <laughs> before the mountains formed, the dinosaurs ruled the earth. Um, I, uh, I, I've been acting since I was very young, like most of us, did, did a lot of theater. And about 18 years ago, I was living and working in Houston, and somebody said to me, hey, uh, I was working on a video production, and they said, hey, you've got a lot of background in acting, don't you? And I said, yeah. And they said, you should go and audition for this place in town called ADV Films. They buy these Japanese shows, and they dub them into English, and they're looking for actors. Now, what I did not say was, well, how much does it pay? or how is this going to be distributed? All I heard was acting. And as an actor, you want to act. You look for chances to act. You, that's all you really care about is, I want to do the thing I love. So I went and auditioned, and uh, I got cast as Vega in Street Fighter II. Mm. And I, it was the weirdest thing, because I'd never done any kind of voice, uh, like voice acting work. And I thought, well, that was, I left that day, and I thought, well, that was a, a fun, one-time weird thing to do in my life, and I'm gonna go back to the normal things I do. And a couple weeks later, they called me and they said, hey, we got another show, do you wanna come and be in it? And I was like, okay. <laughs> and 
another and another and another. And then fast forward a couple of years and I was invited to an anime convention. Now, I'm a Star Trek fan and I went to Star Trek conventions when I was a little kid, but I didn't even know there were anime conventions. And I went and I met people from Funimation and they said, hey, you want to come up north and be in Dragon Ball Z? And I was like, okay. <laughs> and then started doing work with Funimation and then met people from New York and did Pokemon and then meet people from LA and start doing Vampire Night, Naruto and all that stuff out there. And I could have never planned this. This is where I was going with that comment. I would have never imagined in a million years that any of this would have ever happened when you step through that door and you have no idea what's on the other side. I was a little kid. My friends and I would do voices from Speed Racer. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I had no idea Speed Racer was anime. I just knew it was weird. You know what I mean? It didn't look like Scooby-Doo. It didn't sound like Bugs Bunny. It was just different, but I liked it. So fast forward all these like decades now, and, and I'm a part of, of this anime industry that I love so dearly. Um, so I, I am extremely grateful, because I didn't plan it. I had no idea it would ever happen, but I sure love being here. I loved hearing all of that. Um, I, well, like, a lot of other people on this panel. Um, I started doing theater when I was really young and oh, uh, 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 and started doing theater really young and I got a lot of compliments on my voice when I started. People were always like, your voice, your voice is very strong. And I was like, oh, okay, all right. And Tracy Ullman was like my hero when I was younger and I would just like constantly watch Tracy Ullman videos and try to do all her characters. I was like obsessed with her. I did a, if anybody knows what a humorous interpretation is in high school. You did, you did HI? Yes. So uh, I did, I used to do Tracy Ullman humorous interpretation for a debate and speech competition. Uh, and yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it was so great. Anyway, so uh, did, that's kind of how I started like playing around. I really liked messing with my voice. And then I ran a theater company for a really long time. I honestly stayed away from doing any sort of like film or TV or voice. Like I was just kind of like, I am a serious theater actor. Look at my beautiful art. <laughs> and after a couple of years of doing that and loving it, but also kind of being like, I want to do more, I want to do more. And I've always loved cartoons and I've always been a huge, huge animation nerd. And I was like, you know what? I want to. I want to do more voiceover, and right when I was like, I want to start doing voiceover, I met Anna Hollem, and we became friends when we were working, I've told this story before, but we became friends while we were working together for the Austin Junior League, and she kept telling me about her husband's company. She's like, oh, my husband has this company, Rooster Teeth. And I was like, oh, I don't know what it is. Oh, tell me about it, please. Um, and we would talk about it, and I kind of forgot that she told me, and like a year later, I see an audition post for Rooster Teeth, and I'm like, oh, that's that company, that's, on his husband's company. I'll submit, you know, my headshot, my resume and whatnot. And so it was for Red versus Blue. And I submitted my stuff and I showed up and they're like, oh, okay. And basically Bernie and Matt had no idea that I was an actor. They just thought I was like Anna's random friend. <laughs> so they weren't paying attention to my audition at all. And then when I started talking, I just saw Bernie go. <laughs> and just like look for my headshot. And he's like, wait, you're an actor? And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's why I'm here. And then, and then I got it, and they were like, you know, you're, you're perfect, you're great, and it was, that was really fun. So that's how I started my, my Rooster Teeth journey, and then I started uh, working at DC Universe Online with Alex Keller, who is a badass, and uh, started doing Lashina and a whole bunch of Green Lantern, like, side characters, and just, I've probably voiced, like, 20 different characters for DCUO, just little, small, little parts, random woman, random person on the street, whatever. And then uh, while I was, I did Lashina, and then Alex was like, hey, um, Arlene is retiring. And I was like, what? And then he offered me Harley Quinn, and I had a heart attack and fell on the ground and was the happiest person on the planet um, for a really long time, and I still am really happy about that. By the way, I'd like to point out, uh, I'm, I'm the very first person to ever get uh, a Harley Quinn figure autographed 
by you once you once you knew you had the part. It made me so yeah. happy when you were like, I have to get you first. I was like, yay! <laughs> <laughs> yes, please, I get to sign as Harley now, that's so cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, then just, you know, auditioning and doing other shows and trying to get more and yeah. And, oh, and y'all will like this because Sam and I, at that audition, that's where I met Sam and uh, for that initial audition, and we were in the same room, and I remember hearing her and being like, oh, this girl's so good. This girl's so good. And I'm, I'm, you're, the CT side was like a paragraph long. I remember this. The CT side was really long, and the Carolina side was like two lines. It was two lines. So I remember thinking like, oh, 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 like CT, this is the character to get. Like, this is who I want. And it's still an amazing character. She's so good in it. Um, she's so good. She's my favorite. You're the best. You're the best. Stop it. Um, except your brilliant talent. Um, <laughs> and I was like reading it and I was like, oh wow, uh, that's what she's gonna get. That's so great. And then they gave me this two line character and I'm like, oh, this is so cool. You know, and, uh, turns out it's like this like super badass character. <laughs> I like, couldn't be happier to get. But I also get to meet the beautiful Sam Ireland there. Very similar to everybody else on this panel. Uh, yeah, I grew up doing theater ever since I was like, I think eight. And uh, in high school I did, I, if, you're, if you have this in your high school and you're in high school, I highly suggest it. It's called um, like, what is it, National Forensics League. It's a part of the speech and debate. And you can do, um, it's like competitive acting and it's a one man show. You get like a 10 minute monologue and for comedy you usually play multiple characters and you pop, 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 pop and you have different voices, um, physicality and everything. It was one of my favorite things to do besides theater in high school. And um, like I did, if anybody knows the co comedian Bill Hicks, um, I did, I was this little 16 year old girl doing Love All the People, his uh, book for my HI and uh, oh my God, no competition. Way. And I went to state with it. And um, so don't, yeah, you could be a middle-aged man at 16 years old, but um, <laughs> <laughs> if you want. <laughs> but, that was the coolest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't expect I did that. But, um, but uh, yeah, so, but I just, I did fall into voice acting. I'm not formally trained. Um, and I hate saying that, but it's true. And uh, Rooster Teeth had an open casting call, and I lucked out, and I met Jen, and um, I met Shannon, I met, I met everybody there. And so I was CT, and then CT, you know, uh, that, <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> and I heard that Ruby was being, um, I actually heard Ruby like voice of mouth, like through the theater realm in Austin, and I went over to Brandon Farmahimi in uh, live action, and I said, uh, is there like a role I can audition for in this new show that y'all are doing? And I don't know, uh, they said that, yeah, there might be. Uh, and then he sent me the picture of Nora and I fell in love with her instantly. And- Cause she's the best character. <laughs> 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 I love her so much. But, um, and it worked and my, I went in there and I just, I felt great. She was a part of me and uh, instantly. And it was the best Christmas I got the phone call that I was gonna be her. And then Camp Camp happened. I don't really do much voice acting outside of Rooster Teeth, to be honest. I'm auditioning like everybody else for commercial work, any kind of stuff. I've done voice acting for live action, which is pretty cool. Um, but besides that, I'm just here in this realm and I'm really, really grateful I fell into it because it's something that I never thought I'd do. And I love doing it, and anyone who's interested, we all know why we love it. So, that's it. What I love about hearing everybody um, uh, describe how they got into the business, you know, for people that are thinking about getting in, or if you are right now trying to get in, is that there is no common thread. It's all sort of random. You just have to kind of start doing it. Maybe it's because you put together your demo reel and you're actually putting it out there or you know people or you just hear that there's an audition and you go for it but I love hearing stuff like that I um, I, I grew up 
with these things called cassettes that, um, yeah, no, Tell I'll us more, later, Grandpa. Yeah. <laughs> Show of hands, how many people understand what you do with a pencil and a cassette? With the, okay, oh, 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 my people. There's still awesome. hope for the future. Okay, yeah. So, um, uh, but I, I had like all the uh, stories on cassette for um, Star Wars and Raiders of the Lost Ark and a bunch of movies that kind of came out around then and would just listen to them over and over and over and would fall asleep to them and uh, would then insist on doing all the voices, much to my friend's chagrin whenever we would play that stuff. And um, I hadn't realized how much just playing around as a kid and, and mimicry kind of laid a decent foundation for that. Cut to, um, here's a shocker, I was a big fucking geek in high school. What? Yeah, no, I know, spoilers, yeah. Um, but uh, mostly a uh, theater geek. So uh, junior high and high school, did a lot of theater. Uh, um, I was formally trained in acting, which by the way made me so much money I went right back for a computer science degree, if that tells you anything. <laughs> but um, uh, I, I look much better off camera. So I, and people tell me, hey, you've, you've got a good voice, you should start doing this. And after a lot of people kept telling me, no, you've got a voice, you should try something. I was like, okay, give it a shot. And um, connected with a, an agent here in Austin and was doing a bunch of like real estate commercials for radio and things like that. And then um, uh, we were talking about ADV films. So then I got this call, uh, hey, do you wanna do something narrative? Yes, and uh, I wound up, of all things, doing the voice of Lei Wu Long in Tekken. It was my very first voice gig. And, um, and then it just kind of took off from there. So I did uh, a ton of things through ADV. Um, you can look it all up. Like one of the more fun ones that a lot of people understand is uh, Sano, Sanosuke from Roni Kenshin. Not the earlier stuff, not, not the first episodes, but like the, the, the later part of the run. And then, um, and just kind of kept going and then um, did other stuff at the day job and was voice acting on the side and uh, started going more focused on production. Started working for Rooster Teeth and had been at Rooster Teeth for about a year. I started off as a VFX artist on RVB9 and um, by the time RVB10 rolled around, that little magic fucking thing happens where um, you know, they came down and said, hey man, do you wanna record a line? Yes, I'm your guy. What am I doing? You are soldier number two, and you're gonna, you know, get shot here in just a second. I'm like, I don't care. This is awesome. Yeah. So uh, uh, you've got the the two green marines standing on uh, a hangar deck early uh, before the the freelancers um, land on the hangar, take the guys out, and just blaze through and, and keep shooting everything up. And I was thrilled to like have anything in a rooster teeth piece. And then uh, the guys from Smosh visited, and they re-recorded the lines <laughs> for the guys from Smosh. So uh, it wasn't until much later uh, with Ruby that, uh, yeah, the, the money factor kicked in. And I uh, you know, was doing um, compositing and some editing and stuff on Ruby, and then Monty had like, oh, hey man, you've done voice acting before. I'm like, yeah. What are you doing here? Was his question. I'm like, oh, I'm you know, doing production stuff now. And, uh, but then he asked me if I wanted to do Torchwick, and the rest is the rest. Um, but uh, I kind of like to tell a, a story when um, we have guests come visit us at the new Rooster Teeth Animation Studio, which is down, down the street from um, where everybody else is. And uh, the cool thing about it is I, I'm, I'm glad that we can finally give everybody like a real uh, audio booth to record in. The, the history yes. of Rooster Teeth can be told through the history of recording for yes, the show. Yes, it can. Yeah, so uh, it started off, I think, you know, their first recording booth was Bernie's closet in the back of his apartment. And they Which, to be fair, is, if you don't have a home studio, the best place to record audio. <laughs> no, seriously. And, and, and yeah. point C, again, hey, you know, pay attention. Like, what, yeah, what you do, you just need to find the, the most sound deadening corner of your house or apartment or whatever. And in their particular case, it was his bedroom closet. They would leave the clothing hanging so it would deaden sound more. They would hand you a mic and a script and presumably, you know, either a flashlight or turn on the light and say, go in there and record your lines. And then uh, after that, they were, they were downtown for a little bit. When I came on board, they were at 636, and um, it was still literally a closet, and it shared a paper-thin wall with the company bathroom. True. Yeah, so what we would do is whenever we were recording folks for RVB, we would put up a sign on the bathroom door that says, you know, please don't use a bathroom right now, recording in progress, and everyone's like, 
screw you, I'm going to go. So, you know, we would be bringing these professional actors and we'd be like, I, uh, okay, hold for flushing. <laughs> uh, they're washing their hands now. Oh, at least they're washing their hands, that's cool. I think uh, we got, yeah, like, they're done. I think we got like one good fart recorded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was like deadened and like distant, like very distant, like <laughs> we know what that was. Like a body dropping. And, Something and, was dropping. Uh, and then, yeah, no, it's just been amazing to see that, um, uh, you know, Rooster Teeth cares about its actors, and they're, you know, we're investing in, like, really cool environments now. We want to keep everybody in a good place, and so you can kind of be comfortable and play around and run around to the booth if that's your thing to warm up. I think, I think Miles, of all people, can attest. I say that every time I come to the new booth, how much I love it, and I physically run in circles in it every single time. Yes. I'm not exaggerating. No, he's not. He's it's fantastic. Very, very yeah. <laughs> Although, the last, the last couple times I've come in to record, um, I'll, I'll go to adjust the mic because I'm a little taller than most of the actors, and they'll be like, uh, 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 no, 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 don't, don't, don't touch that there. Miles broke that. Miles broke it! <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, you have to it. you have to do this. You have to only move this knob because Miles broke it. <laughs> <laughs> Alina, yes. Alina doesn't let me adjust the microphone anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I over tightened it. <laughs> I was gonna say too, just thinking about everyone who's up here right now. Uh, for us or like our generation, for lack of a better term, uh, me, Michael, and Miles, and I assume Jessica could relate to, is like we got our start with loving things like anime in like seventh grade. So, uh, Toonami was a big factor for that. I feel like that's the gateway drug. It is. It's the gateway drug into anime. They got us. But, um, uh, I mean, we, we grew up looking up to these voice actors and hearing their performances, and for a lot of us, that's people that we're currently working with now. I mean, like, Vic obviously comes to mind, and then I was a nerd, and I came up to Gray at work, and I was like, did you voice the Nosuke in Roroni Kenshin? Um, I love your work. But I, it's very awesome to be able to work with these people and these people, again, who we've looked up to for years and years and years, and now here we are. So, so yeah, what she's again. saying is that some of us are old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you need some blood thinner later on, I'll give yeah, you some just share. a little bit. I'll go for it. <laughs> Let me, how many people here have um, recorded off of another actor at the same time, or has everyone always just done it, you know, one track at a time? What, uh, you well, like, like, like you're the only person in the booth or not, or do you have another person that you've been able to act to and which do you like or not? Uh, hmm. Well, Shannon and I got to record together. Yeah, we did uh, for year, RBD 15, we recorded the Wash and Carolina stuff together. That's the first time Jen and I had done uh, work in the booth at the same time. Um, it's great. The setup is, um, I think you're going to have to uh, take it up a notch again because the setup was a little weird um, so that we wouldn't pick up each other's dialogue on our uh, respective mics. Um, we, we, we did all of our acting with our backs to each other, which was a little, <laughs> which is a little weird because it was a super intimate moment. I'm, yeah. touch, I'm touching her hand and all this stuff, and we're like, we were back to back. We should get mirrors. <laughs> yeah. we do mirrors. Well, it, was, it, it recreated a lot of like, hilarious moments where we're like, we're trying to connect, but like I can't, I can't, can't see, can't see her. <laughs> So like when we, were, we we talked about this at the last panel we did yesterday, but that that last moment where we record, we have that you know the little car wash moment where we grab hands, we get a little little finger finger hand action, <laughs> and uh, uh, but when we were we were going to record that, and then he has that really. I have a very suggestive very line suggestive that I line. said as suggestively as I possibly could. He said it. It was like Buffalo Bill, y'all. It was the creepiest, <laughs> creepiest shit, and I broke. I hear it. I, I hear broke it. Like, down. I was laughing. like, I'm going for this line, y'all. I mean, in my, I didn't tell anybody in advance. Go, dude. Then. Go. Do it. Take off your armor. <laughs> <laughs> Vagina shriek into body, uh, awful. And then awful. she screamed and started laughing, and then yeah. we, then the, then the directors were like, eh, you dial that back a little bit. Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> Pull that back a little bit, Shannon. <laughs> maybe not that. Maybe not that. <laughs> well, cool. We could probably keep geeking out for forever, but why don't we take some questions yeah. from the audience? The questions are always good. Yeah, oh, yeah. Feeding frenzy. Aisle. Calm and orderly. Calm and orderly. Fashion. Yeah, it's okay. Don't you Thanks. run. No. If you run, I'll be like, get out of here. Yeah. Take no. off your armor. 
I was about to say. Oh. <laughs> well, cool. And we'll, we'll start over here to my left. Hi, uh, Lindsay, Michael, me, uh, from all of us, congratulations on Iris. We'll all be looking forward to her uh, autograph session next year. Um, one thing I want to know, um, do your characters like ever bleed into each other? Like, um, does Ozpin and Quartermaster ever switch jobs? Uh, does Edward Elric ever talk like a drunk bad luck charm? Um, I want to answer the Ozpin uh, uh, Quartermaster question because it kind of came up the other day. I've realized um, that if Rooster Teeth has a property um, w which they may need a character who perhaps is immortal and exists outside the, the bounds of space and time, I will probably end up doing that character's voice. Uh, <laughs> So, so their voices aren't very similar, but I, I feel like I'm being typecast as an immortal. So there you have it. I'm, I'm 750 years old. Uh, my, that didn't I, answer your question. I'm, I'm fortunate enough where I've got Sun Wukong and uh, Max, so I'm, I'm pretty separate there. Yeah. <laughs> They're pretty polar opposites. Uh, there are times when I'm doing Space Kid and it becomes a little too ruby, but luckily, like, I guess, whereas, uh, well, both of the characters kind of accept, like, people criticizing them or talking shit to them, they're just like, yeah, it's okay, like, no big deal, thanks, Max. Uh, so that's totally fine, but I guess, like, the timber of the voice sometimes gets difficult and we have to re-record, so there's a few times where, like, I don't know, Ruby will bleed into Space Kid and Kimball, et cetera. I think if I'm ever doing Locus with any other character, I know I've gone wrong, so <laughs> it's... The fact that you could bounce back and forth between General Donald Doyle and Locus was still something I thought was super cool about working with you in the Chorus Trilogy. And they kept scheduling on the same day. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, well, seriously, there's like, there's a good gray in the booth and get everything uh, for the next couple of chapters of RVB. So it'd be, yeah, Doyle followed by Locus. Which, essentially, the difference between those two is a glass of whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> Um, both David and Jean scream like a girl. <laughs> oh, I mean, I could, I, could, uh, I could do Cinder and Sonic go together, and I feel like that would be a terrible combination. <laughs> so, that's all. No, cool. Thanks for the question. Edward Elric plays with no one. <laughs> <laughs> He's a loner. <laughs> You know, I, I think you're talking about combining characters, right? Is that ever it bleeds over? Did it you, bleed you know over? what I would say, and I, I think this is like a, 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 like a teachable moment from a voice acting standpoint. Voice acting is about acting. Um, it's not about changing your voice with every character you play. Um, some of us have very recognizable voices. And it's very easy to go, oh, that's so-and-so, or I recognize that voice. But when we're cast as a character, the goal is not to change your voice to some voice you've never done before. The goal is to play the character honestly and authentically. Uh, I've, I've often used the example like, you know, you take a, a popular actor, uh, you know, Robert De Niro. He's played a million characters and he always sounds like Robert De Niro because his goal is not to always change his voice. His goal is to play the role. So it's more attitude. A lot of characters, you could pull one line from 10 different characters that, that you've played and string them all together and go, oh yeah, that's clearly the same guy. But if you watch each of those shows, the character's personality and their attitude is different. And that's really where the acting comes in, uh, as opposed to just voices. It's, it's really about mm -hmm. acting. So they, they can kind of bleed over unless the actor is really focused on, on the character, you know, on playing the character and communicating the character's personality. You mentioned the one line too, and I think we can all agree, but it's so awesome when you find that one line that gets you into the character you want to play. Yeah. And that's like the best trigger to get you into the performance mode also. So I don't know if you guys want to talk about any lines that you have from shows that you play where you're like, that's it, that's it. What's yours for Ruby these days? Uh, for Ruby, it's, um, hi, I'm Ruby. Like over and over again, introducing herself. Or, um, well, one teacher in particular. And then that's it. Let me ask you, <laughs> do, you, do, you do you warm up differently for Chibi at all? Not, not really. Chibi, it's the same voice, but it's a different thought and uh, personality going off of Vic said, so like, uh, it's happier, so you just kind of forget all the sad stuff that happened in Volume 3. <laughs> Pure <laughs> still happened. alive! <laughs> hey, uh, um, 
yeah, Torchmix was just always, hello, Red. It was just, <laughs> oh, yeah, just a couple of syllables, it's like, yeah, that's him. I, uh, uh, I, I know Miles knows this, and everyone, when I go into the booth, whenever I have to do Pira, it's just lots of, John, 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 John. <laughs> I just say John's name, like, over and over, like, get on my tippy toes. I'm like, I, I would have John, expected, John. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was John. Sorry. John, I name uh, my TV's Ren, Nora, Pira. Um, <laughs> and he's very, John tries to be confident, but isn't. So it's a lot of, uh, right, um, okay. Uh, David is just, good morning, campers. Oh, Max. And then, um, like you were just saying, uh, honestly, uh, Felix's voice isn't that different from mine. I'm just way more of an asshole. So I just go and... <laughs> well, that's Carolina for me. I mean, Carolina's basically me, but just a little bit deeper. Yeah. Just a little bit. It's the easy, it's the most like comfortable, like, oh yeah, I could live here. This is good. This is nice. I like this. Yeah. <laughs> I like doing uh, uh, Chibi Sun because Sun is is like if I if I was just a nice person, I think it's like what, <laughs> right. That's that's what Sun would sound like, and then Chibi Sun is like him on crack. And it's just, just like I'm just like this going in there to do Sun. It's always some absurd <laughs> thing he's doing in Chibi. I think uh, by the way, uh, I need to go ahead and schedule. If you guys have any more. Um, Stuff for Locust to record. If we can like do that tomorrow, because it turns out convention voice gray is all, I'm already warmed up. Let's just do this. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna. I'm. I'm cosplaying as Soldier 76 later, and I'm just walking around going, "We're all soldiers now." <laughs> <laughs> I've got you in my sights. I need to leave. We also get the benefit of working again with our friends or our coworkers, like playing off of Miles. I think of warming up for camp camp with Space Kid. Like uh, sometimes he'll just talk down to me, and I'll be like, "Okay, whatever. <laughs> Thanks, Max." <laughs> or for Max, when uh, Michael warms up with you, uh, Michael, would you like to demonstrate what you do to warm up, please? Are you ready to go, Max? No. No, oh, come on. No. Come on. Suck I know my you. dick, David. I don't want to do it. I hate everything! I hate nature! <laughs> Love that energy, Max. Keep it up. It's, it's hard to, like, keep, like, doing Max. He's, like, up there where, like, I'll, I'll lose him sometimes in the middle of doing a line. So I usually warm up like that. But it's funny, in the middle of line recordings, we'll be doing a line. And I'll just, I'll be doing the line and be like, well, I don't know. Suck my dick. Suck my dick. I don't know about that, you motherfucker. I don't know about that, you fuck. Like, I do it all the time. By the way, a point master craftsman. A master craftsman. Bonus points to the fan who goes ahead and takes the audio of this uh, panel and animates that moment. <laughs> but, by the way, before we move on, uh, do we have any other voice talent that has worked for Rooster Teeth here in the audience? I oh, thought, hey, yeah, Bill. hey, so stand up. This is William Orndorff, everybody. <laughs> William. Let's do it. Do, do, you, do you got a second? Can we pull you up here? Yeah, you, you got it. Oh, man, he's, he's booked. I'll, t I'll tell you what, I was going to tell you what he's done for us before. I'm just going to let you hear it. Yeah, yeah. Come on up, come on up. This is about to blow your fucking mind. Y'all giving me a case of the vipers. Uh, you <laughs> you want to direct me? Yeah. Oh, shit. Give me something. Which one? Um, uh, you want the, the little one or the big one? <laughs> well. Gum, sorry. <laughs> William has been doing the voice of all the Grimm ever since volume one. He, um... And these days... Like, literally, literally all of them, like, even the weird, creepy, like, clicks of the Deathstalker and the Seer, as well. Yeah. Uh, the Knuckle Lavy. 
That's well, it's like, and then he also plays Hazel, <laughs> the hey, softest hey, Hazel spoken of the more. evil characters. Yeah. <laughs> and how about our sound team? Is anyone here from the audio team for Mr. Teeth Animation? Hey, hey, Kyler. Hey, Kyler. Stand, Kyler. Stand. Get up, Sorry, Kyler. Get up. Kyler. Kyler. Have a Seriously moment. though, like the <laughs> it's the first time we saw Will do any one of the Grim. I remember uh, Carrie and I were looking at him through the booth, and he did this like rrr, rrr, rrr. I can't fucking do that. And uh, I just remember I turned to Carrie and I went, "What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> He's not human." <laughs> so awesome. It brought up a good point though too. Like you think of voice acting as just you know playing a character, which it is, and you get to speak whatever language you speak. But there's also voice acting opportunities with just playing creatures or, or making certain sounds or, or things with your voice. Like, uh, D. Bradley Baker comes to mind immediately. That guy can do anything. And same thing, when you watch him do his voice recordings, you're like, what the fuck is happening? This guy is nuts. <laughs> but he gets the jobs. What's, what's also interesting is that even, even if you're playing a, a, um, a main dialogue character, then you're still going to have to do a lot of vocalizations Ooh, for yeah. uh, gestures, for action scenes, for, you know, subtle emotional moments. <laughs> there's there's a little game. I I I try to remember who dubbed it. This I've forgotten if it was, it was you know, Carrie or it was you, me or Carrie. I don't remember. Yeah, uh, it, it turns into a little game of what we call pooper sex. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we record. Uh, yeah, we we, we call yeah. them efforts. You know, fight exertions, yes. get taking damage. I have found that offensive efforts sound like you're pooping. Uh, uh, whereas taking damage sounds like sex. Uh, uh. Yep. I feel yep. like that plays a lot about like your sexual life. <laughs> are you a bottom? Thanks, Jess. My parents are in the front row. <laughs> Hi, Mom. I'm an actor now. Seriously, seriously, that was the thing that you objected to. <laughs> of all the things that's happened on this panel, that all the bothered you've you. Done, Miles, really? That? That's what? That's it? <laughs> Let's take another question. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> take up your arms, Miles. Question. What's? <laughs> what side are we on next? That, that's All right, it. go. Thank you, audience. All right. Well, I'm actually a writer, but the thing is, I see like Miles and a lot of the other writers in Rooster Teeth, and actually a lot of other things. They voice a lot of their own characters. Now, I'm not very co confident in my own voice acting skills, but would you say it would be, you know, like it's a, you would say go for it for trying to do your own character's voice? Because I would think no one but the writer would know the voice exactly, as that's the one you were I, I, going for. I think the question was, if you write the character, is it easier to voice the character? Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess it depends if you're also directing, because if, um, if you're, yeah, if you're directing and have written that character, then yeah, you probably have a really fucking good understanding of that character. Um, but I, like, one of the things I love about voice acting is, I'm kind of a pudgy white dude, um, but I can be a sword-wielding knight or a villainous mercenary, um, <laughs> or, or I can be Cinder sometimes. Yeah. Okay, so th the no. only way okay, yeah. the only way I was able to do Cinder was because I had Miles do all of Cinder's lines first, and listening to Miles do sexy, sultry, evil woman is my favorite thing, and I need you to release that. It's so great. No. Miles, Miles doing any character that's not him is amazing because he commits to it. Like, he, it doesn't matter that it's not ever going to be used or ever going to be heard. He doesn't fucking care. Thank he, you, ma'am. Yes! Exactly. I salute you, Greer. Oh, charge is my favorite to do. Simmons, too. Simmons. Uh, fucking, so, all right. So it, it's just, it's great. It's oh, great. Roman. You'll know what you need when you need to know it. Oh. <laughs> so good. It's fun. That was so good. Uh, so, but to what I was getting at though was like, uh, it, it, like, like Vic was saying earlier, which I think is 100% true. Like, uh, voice acting is acting first, and then maybe extra voice stuff second. But like, I couldn't, I couldn't do like Hazel. I couldn't do Locust. Like, so yeah, I guess uh, you know. Uh, uh, I, I still, like Felix in the later years, like Matt was the one, because at first I was like, I sound way too young to be Felix. So Matt was like, Matt, give it a shot. Um, and then once I was like, okay, cool, I'm Felix. Yeah, going in the, into the booth was really easy and, and made it fun. And also in those days, whenever I was having a problem with an Xbox 360, I could go in and be like, hey, can I please record some fucking Felix lines right now? Because I need to get some rage out. So that was good. I had to do Jean one time though, and I was pissed. I was like, God fucking damn this shit. All right, Ruby, hey. <laughs> <laughs>
Thanks for the question. Next. Um, it kind of ties into the whole acting thing and warming up to become your characters. I was wondering how you would uh, take the direction you're given for Locus or David or Felix or Edward Ed Elric and like find something in yourself that brought that voice out, like rage for Felix or being completely done for Locus. Like, where do you go to get these voices? A dark, dark place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica just sits in a closet for a few hours by herself. Yeah. No, I mean, no, no, I, I just go into my comment section and every one of my social media things. <laughs> 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 and I'm like, all right, I'm there. <laughs> I mean, the, I, I think, but the, the key to acting, and I think the key to making any art is, uh, I mean, somebody, I don't, there's some saying that, like, by the time you're five years old, you've experienced all of the possible range of emotions that you can have, right? It, all of these different depths of despair and love and joy and whatever. And I think the real key for being an artist is, is just finding those avenues into yourself to tap into those things. It, it's not like any of us don't have the capabilities to be any of the characters that we play um, from an emotional standpoint. So the real trick is just kind of that, whatever the inner workings are of like, how do I get in touch with that place? And sometimes it's hard to find those things in the character if you're like locked off those parts of yourself to yourself. But I think it's really, we've all got the capability to find, find those characters because we've experienced all those things. That's, that's my take on it. Yeah, that's my take I, on acting in general. I think it differs too for everyone, like process, like what, 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 what works for you isn't right. always gonna work for the next person. So it really is like find what works for you. Like personally, I have been through a bunch of trauma in my life, but I don't like pulling from that trauma directly because I feel like it sticks with me. Mm. So I tend to use physical recall and physical body, uh, gestures to kind of bring emotions to the forefront, but that's me. So it, it, it kind of depends, it's different for everyone. It's different for everyone. I think for, for me, I do daydreaming a lot, and because um, I'm, I'm, I'm a big Meisner nerd, um, and uh, so I like to do vivid imagination and vivid dreams and um, daydreaming just because um, I don't like, I, I don't think emotional recall is for everyone. Um, I haven't been through serious traumatic events, but um, I feel that I can recover faster from pulling from something of complete imagination. And um, that's, what, that's what I kind of work with, even though I don't play a lot of dark characters in voice acting, but, um, but I do like in other parts of the world of acting. Um, and that's, and, and like everyone's saying, it's different for everybody how you get into that emotional depth. What, are, what avenue is good for you? And that gets you the best results too, and um, multifaceted re results as well, so. Um, but I think, Gray, they asked about like locusts, what for you to like get there, right? Oh, I mean, um, I think a lot of what everyone was saying was pretty valid. I would just tack on, you know, you have to find what works for you, like you were saying, but it's also um, what worked for that particular day. Which also yeah. kind of goes to what Miles was saying that there's some times where, uh, depending on what's going on around the office, it's it's going to be really easy for me to go in and work out some frustration as Locus or maybe Tor Torchwick. Um, there's going to be other days where, um, yeah, you just have to have a different bag of tricks and and bust them out differently for for different days. And um, yeah, just a, a bunch of self awareness and stay kind of centered, so then you can go into the direction that that character's attitude needs that day. It's Kind of a rough way to explain it, I guess. But I don't know. Hey, you know, you know what else, Gray, is that um, it all ends up having to come through your voice. Uh, there is a lot of different types of acting, right? Uh, if you're a stage actor, you have a whole bunch of things to draw from to communicate your character, right? You have your facial expressions, you have your body language, you have your costume, you have the makeup, you have a whole number of g gestures. You have, you have a whole number of, of things to choose from to communicate your character without ever saying a word. But when, it, when you get in, into a little box, into a little padded booth in front of a microphone, you can make mean faces and you can, you can you, you, none of those things will actually communicate. It all needs to come through the voice. And that's the little trick of it. I've seen really good actors, and I know you all have, really good actors come into a booth and to they voice act. They and they don't know what the hell they're doing. It just doing. doesn't work, it yeah. doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Because they're so used to communicating through visual means and other means 
great film stars that you hear in animated features that are flat as a pancake because they're used to communicating with cute little faces that they do or some little shtick that they do that you love on screen, but it doesn't work in voice acting. So that's really a trick. I've seen people that have been in a booth and they've been crying and it sounds like they're laughing. I mean, they're, that extra, that last single element of making it come through your voice, whatever that emotion is supposed to be, is, is really the trick. All of these acting and emotions and feelings, ultimately it has to come right down into the microphone. And that's the little trick of it, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And also, like, to your, to your point, like, the faces I make in the booth when I am doing any of my characters, Dear God, I would never make those faces <laughs> on stage or on film, especially ever, especially on film. I look like a crazy person. I'd never get work, like, <laughs> ever. So it's, um, while I do use my, my face and my body for voice work, it helps, but I look insane. Like, it's just, you, I don't, for me personally, I feel like it's different for, you know, like we were saying, for every actor, but like, in order to help get my voice there and to really, really display the emotion for everyone. I play a lot of pretty intense characters, I'd say. Um, and in order to get that uh, emotion, like I have to physically be really over exaggerated in order to get that to come across. But like, that would look like so silly on camera. <laughs> never do that but Branch, branching off of that too I know people ask me like what do you prefer voice acting or acting on film and I think everyone I talk to say oh I much prefer film you can actually emote like physically and that will read for your character I say I think I enjoy voice acting because you don't have to worry about your physicality yeah you get to look like a weirdo who cares if it sounds good it sounds good exactly yeah. it's and very then, freeing yeah for Ruby especially there's a behind the scenes video that Gray took where like because Ruby's so high energy like I kind of go into dolphin mode in the booth where you're doing all of this <laughs> dolphin mode <laughs> Moving around like this, yeah. <laughs> but hey, sounds good. <laughs> Thank you. Next cool. question. Hi. Hi. Um, I have two questions, but one's quick. Is that cool? Sure. sure. Okay. Um, can you do the locust voice? Yes. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, <clears throat> it's like he's here. Yeah, no, it's, it's uh, locus is a man of few words, and thankfully it only takes a couple of... <laughs> Actually, he's getting frustrated with Felix, also helps with Felix. Um, hey, bud, yeah, how's it going? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Come on, one more murder. <laughs> yeah, there, there's, there's a great deal of just, you know, speaking through, he, he, he tends to vocalize a lot, like, sub, like this guttural stuff, this... Uh, unfortunate, you know, this... Oh, it's just it's one, one little punctuation. Wait, Greg, can you do bedtime stories in that voice? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I could listen to that when I fall asleep. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and my second question is, what is like the biggest difference, do you think, between theater acting, film acting, and voice acting, and what do you all prefer? Ooh, that's hard. The biggest difference? I mean, I think Vic t touched on it a lot when he talked about, you know, just the, the voice acting, it's got to come through your voice. Um, and that's your, that's the only tool that is at your disposal in the final product, yeah. right? Um, so they, I, I mean, for me, because I do all of it, I do all three. Um, theater acting I love because of the immediate feedback from the audience. Yes. And that is an ex incredibly powerful thing. And I would never want to live in a world where I didn't get to do live performance, whether it's improv or scripted acting, because that, you and the audience are an entity uh, that only exists in that moment, and you, the audience is, is a vital component of the performance. It's so powerful. It's, it's so very, powerful. very powerful. Voice acting is really cool because of everything that everybody said. You only have one tool. Um, it's like a drawing as opposed to a painting, right? You've got, you've got a pencil. You don't have a palette of all the different things. Um, and then film acting is, is really cool. Uh, film acting is really weird. It's because a lot it's, of subtlety. It's a lot of subtlety, and it's yeah. also the process is so fractured, and but so repetitive, right? So you're mm -hmm. like, this scene that we're doing is like two people sitting at a coffee table, and you're having a conversation, but you do it 19 times because you have to get coverage from all these different camera angles. And so 
it's its own little thing where you can keep digging into it because you're doing the lines over and over again, and 80% of them don't make the final cut because they're just going to take the ones that work. Um, so that's kind of cool because, like, yeah. you know, for and voice acting. there's also more spontaneity in film yeah. acting, too. Yeah. You, so don't do, uh, you don't uh, do rehearsals. I really. love them all. Keep hiring me. <laughs> so to, to jump on that, I mean, um, so for voice acting, you have everything that um, Vic and the gang were talking about where um, it ultimately you only have the voice to communicate through. And so you have to be listening and be in tune with yourself and be used to hearing yourself and understanding that what you're doing, whether it's the tension in your throat or extra gestures that you're throwing around in the booth to add a little extra texture to things, what effect is that having? Um, and then for film and theater, yeah, you still have the voice there, and I mean, that needs to ring true, and then it's the, the physicality of it. For me, um, because I did theater for much longer before I, I started playing around on camera, I had a whole bunch of bad habits I needed to break, because, yeah. um, say, we were, we were talking about, um, you know, using uh, Shannon's example for a couple of minutes ago, if, if it's a, you know, person-to-person -person conversation, we're just hanging out at a table, um, you know, this gesture's fine while you and I are, are talking, and you know, maybe, maybe I'm doing this little thing with my finger that tells you that I'm kind of tense right now or whatever. If that's theater and we're sitting across from each other on a table on stage, the person at the back of the house can't see that at all. This, this is not gonna read. Whereas like if it's an extreme close up, you know, and it's projected on a 70 foot screen, you know, the, the more I move my hand, my hand is move, it's, it's moving crazily across the whole screen. Um, but in, in theater, you're gonna have to kind of do this a little bit more, and you're not, you know, not cheerleading exactly, but I mean, like, your, your gestures have to have that much more energy to it yeah. so that they can kind of understand when you're frustrated and whatnot. This, this, this leads to one of, the, the, one of my biggest pet peeves uh, in the world, which is radio pieces of theater performances, they always, I think they sound terrible. KUT, stop recording actors on stage <laughs> doing their lines because it sounds so phony, but because it's devoid of the context of what happens in a theater. If you were in the room watching that play, it would seem normal. When you listen to it on the radio and there's none of the other stuff going on, you're like, God, these people sound so fake. I hate yeah. theater. Well, it's the, same, it's the same when you film theater production. Like, if you film a stage production, sometimes it works. If it's what is this that's hokey like, shit? Yeah, right, but sometimes it works. If it's like naturalism, like Neil Butte, or if it's something that's like a theater, the piece that's meant to be performed, very naturally in a small space, it works on film, but most of the time, you could have an absolutely stunning production where every single actor is amazing, get standing ovations every single night, and you see the film version of it, and you're like, wow, I'm terrible. Like, it just, you have to be in the theater for some of those experiences for it to work. But I'm also, theater's like, that's my baby. Like, <laughs> That was what I grew up doing. That is my life and my favorite thing in the entire world. And I feel like there is no substitute for going and seeing live theater. The impact and the effects that it has on your life and what it can do to change you, the, the, the way you can see humanity, the way you can see people and how things can actually affect others that have nothing to do with you. It changed my life doing theater and being raised in the theater, and, and I, I, I love it, I miss it, I get to do it every once in a while now. I, it's, it's my favorite form of acting, hands down. It's just different, it's just different. Just thinking, I'm sorry, I know we're out of time. Uh, just thinking about different genres as well, for, for preparing characters, um, I don't know if you guys do the same thing, but since we don't have physicality when we do voice acting, where we have that luxury in film and theater, I like to listen to music or find a character's theme song, and that helps me find the emotion, whereas, like, again, with film and theater, you have the physicality that can sometimes lead to the emotion behind a character's performance. Right. Well, you get so. to discover. That's what I love about theaters. You get to live the role from the beginning to the end. And with, like, film and voice acting, like, you go in, you do it real quick, you got to get there fast, and you got to be in. And with theater, you get to ride out the experience and experience the, the character's... It's... I'm sounding like such like an art asshole right now, but it just, it's so... Goddamn hippie. It's so rewarding. It's so rewarding. And to get off stage and be like, I fucking nailed that. Like, you just feel like you just, this, it's so, and, uh, you know, I don't know. It's great. I love it. You know, I, I really miss theater. I, I did too. it for so long, decades. And now if I go sit and if I go to a stage play, 
I literally sit there, white, I'm white knuckling it. I'm holding on to the, ra the, the armrest because I want to be doing that yes. again. Yes. And it's, but it takes a long time. You know, you have to commit a lot of time to mounting a show. Rehearsals and then shows every, you know, for how many Back, weeks you're gonna yeah. run. It, it's a big time commitment. It is. And, uh, and you know, um, I, I always, I've always liked to equate conventions with you guys here at this moment. This is kind of the audience portion that you don't get yeah. as a voice actor. Yeah. You know, you don't, when you're in the booth, the talk if back. you say something heartbreaking, there's nobody there crying. Well, maybe and if mild. you say something funny, but if you, you know what I'm saying, if you yeah, say yeah, something yeah. funny, nobody's laughing. You're sitting alone doing these lines, praying to God that the emotion you're trying to communicate is going to come across. But you don't know if it's going to yet. In, in, in theater, you know, immediately you feel it. If yeah. you connect with the audience, when you say something and you hear the audience go, oh, you know they're there. You know what I mean? Or you say something funny a certain way with some humor and they laugh and like you feel it. There isn't any of that as a voice actor. Yeah. So to come to an event and to meet people and to hear them tell you about a thing you said in this episode that broke their heart or that they laughed for days. Um, that's the other side of the equation of that theater experience that you don't get as a voice actor, you know? Yeah. 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 But speaking of the... Uh, Arsene, deep shit. Yeah, no, but speaking of that, there's also the live interaction, uh, just hanging out here at RTX and getting to talk about this stuff. I think it was really, really cool for everybody to come out and, and chat about this stuff today. We're over time. So we're going to have to take off now. But thank you, thank you, thank you so much for hanging out Yay. with us today. Have a good thank rest of so the day. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. Take care.